Check, check. Thank you, everybody. Hello. Thank you for coming. How's everyone doing? Let me just get my notes up. Great. You were just saying, Larry, this feels like old TV shows like Johnny Carson. Yeah, it makes me think of the Johnny Carson <laughs> set here with the, the plants. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh. Well, we made an effort for you. You're worth it. Um, so, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming out, as he, he so lovely explained, uh, introduced to the Mac in Belfast. Um, the gentleman I have with me today is uh, a humble man. Um, who, uh, phone's off, right? G get your phones off. I'm not having any of that. So Larry's a humble man, and he doesn't like to sing his own praises too much, but he, people, he's a, a, a gentle giant of music that people over the years have, have absolutely stood on the shoulders of when it comes to their own sound. Um, we're going to get into that music and his ideas and his processes, so please give another round for Larry Heard, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So... I kind of want to start with a, a congratulations, because it was your birthday yesterday. Yeah, yeah, I celebrated here in Belfast, yeah. Part of it was at Customs and Immigrations, but, you know, thank you. <laughs> and what did you do for your birthday in Belfast? Well, I tried to recover from our traumatic journey, you know, because oh, we had three flights, and the first one's late, so you can fill in the blank for the rest, yeah, domino effect. But we made it here in one piece, and you just breathe a sigh of relief and lay down on the bed, took my shoes off, watched some channel surf. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm wondering if you're the kind of person that on your birthday kind of takes stock of the year that's been. Are you quite a reflective person on your birthday? Um, no, you would think so by the moodiness of my music, but uh, I'm probably the person who have been working on his birthday just like I was and working on like Christmas or New Year's and things like that when everybody else is focused on something totally different. It's, I don't know how it happens. It just ends up happening, you know? I ask because um, in the last year or so, you've had a remarkable run of work. Mm -hmm. um, you came back as Mr. Fingers. Uh, you came back to performing and touring. I was lucky mm -hmm. enough to see you almost exactly this time a year ago in Detroit okay. uh, at, okay. at Movement, you performed with Mr. White, yeah. uh, oh, which was cool. absolutely yeah. magical. Um, how has the past year or so been for you coming back into that kind of schedule? It's been a little tricky because in the past, even when I was kind of doing DJ um, events and the traveling associated with it, it would always kind of throw me off balance as far as... Um, I, the label would be neglected, my own productions would be neglected, all, all of the music output would stop because of you involved in traveling and that kind of a thing. So it's kind of been the same kind of challenge, but with the additional element of me trying to record an album on the back, forth, back, forth that we were doing, you know, in between the shows. But, but it ended up working out in the end, though. But it was pretty tricky, though. Mm -hmm. um. When you came back as Mr. Fingers mm -hmm. in, in about 2016, when you went back on the road and now with the new album, uh, you took a break for about three or four years. Um, can you kind of set the scene for us where you were in those four years and, and kind of what kind of things you were working on and what you were doing? Well, that's when you saw a lot of remixes come out during that time, though. Disclosure, Lana Del Rey, all those different people. Um, so I didn't really take a break. It was kind of more of a break from um, global traveling. Yeah. So um, that's what I was doing. And even, even with that, I still, it still didn't dawn on me that I hadn't worked on any of my own music. I had applied it to other people's kind of um, doing the remixes and things like that. But it took a little while for the, the light bulb to come on and say, you, you haven't done a release yourself, and especially under the Mr. Fingers moniker, which I kind of let it sit to make sure there were no kind of legal ties to any of the labels, you know, from the past, you know, but then it just got forgotten about after a while. You know. Whereabouts in the world were you making these remixes? Can you set the scene for us a little? Um, my little rinky-dink studio in Memphis, it probably doesn't look like anybody would imagine in their, in their mind, but it's just um, in the, the computer world now, and, uh, two DAWs, a PC and a Mac, and that's what I kind of work off of in my uh, controller. So it's very modest. I've been getting, getting rid of most of the, the rack stuff that's been sitting dormant. Some 
for more than 20 years. I've been in Memphis 21 years, and some things hadn't been unpacked in that whole time. So, yeah, that's what I was. I, I was in my little studio in my house. You know. As you say, you've lived in Memphis now for over 20 years. Yeah. Uh, you're always, you always come with the Association of Chicago, obviously, but since you've lived in Memphis for over 20 years, mm -hmm. what is like the mood and vibe of Memphis as a place to be and live and, and make music? Wow, that's hard to even say because it, it's so normal and that's kind of what I needed, something uh, normal, uh, a counterpoint to stuff I was doing. It was active and going and, you know, a lot of activity around it. I needed somewhere where I could just come to a complete stop where you can actually really take stock of what's going on and, you know, hear your own thoughts. And that's what it is. It's peaceful, it's families, it's barbecue and all that kind of stuff. And Memphis tradition, you know, Stax Records and Elvis Presley and that kind of thing, you know. So it's got the, um, and got uh, strong connections to Chicago because when I came up in Chicago, we had neighbors who moved from Memphis, you had numerous ones, and including um, Memphis transplants like um, Maurice White and the girls from The Emotions and the, the Staples Singers, they were kind of right all there in our neighborhood. And um, Charles Stepney, his house was right across from the grade school I went to, and we would always hear a band over there, but little did we know that was Earth, Wind and Fire doing their, you know, rec um, rehearsals. So it's when you when someone says the phrase, "Oh, the music was just in the air." It was in the air, but literally because it was it across was. the street. It was. It was so so many so many bands, so many musicians. It pretty much you knew if you were getting involved in it, you had to really bring some kind of an A game because it, some of the guys and ladies were just so good. You knew you couldn't come come in half stepping. In Memphis, when you make music, um, you mentioned all these legendary names, these labels, these artists that mm -hmm. are in Memphis or have a connection to Memphis. Um, who are your immediate music community in Memphis? Who do you invite into your rinky-dink studio, as you say, and, and jam with? Nobody really at the moment, because uh, you can meet plenty of DJs, but you can't meet a lot of musicians. And people kind of think they're the same thing, but they're, they're different kind of things that are in the skill set. Um, so I meet plenty of DJs, but I haven't met any musicians other than some of the, uh, we got like four or five guitar players on the album. So I meet plenty of guitar players for some reason. And I think you come across a lot of keyboard players, but I think I pretty much have that covered as far as our project. So. At the moment, uh, there's not any individual comes in other than the, the people helping me out, like doing background vocals and things like that, you know. But no, I'm like a Jimmy Jam without a Terry Lewis at the moment, so the partnership. I think you're both, actually, to be fair. I'm you can sorry. probably count as both of them. Uh, yeah, I do have to kind of act in both capacities, but it's nice, like when myself and Robert were doing Fingers Inc., then it was more of a partnership. Uh, anything, any music idea I cranked out, he could come with a, a lyric idea to, to sit perfectly with it. So it just worked out organically. I ask this because on the new Mr. Fingers album, uh, you do have some Memphis musicians on there. There's a yeah. man called Ed Finney. Yeah, who yeah, he's a was legendary guy. So he's in, in his 70s, he was in um, this jazz, funk, experimental kind of thing called Compost. Back in the early 70s, probably can find that on uh, Discog. Some really cool music on it, too. And he's just a great player, a real nice guy, too. And then all the other people are more younger folks, you know, younger than myself. And you know, Ed, Ed is the senior guy in the, the picture this time around. Yeah. Because uh, this guy, Ed Finney, as you said, played in a, a 1970s kind of prog fusion mm -hmm. kind of band yeah. uh, called Compost. And I think it's really important for us to talk about the musicality of what you do and mm -hmm. like the in-person collaboration of what you do. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about that relationship of working on this new record in the studio uh, with someone like Ed? Like what kind of conversations do you have about music while you're, while you're, you're practicing? Well, we don't have conversations about music. We just start playing music. 
And that's how I kind of come from the world of improvisation, just like Ed and like a lot of people I came up with in Chicago. We, we kind of practiced some of it, every kind of style because you never knew what kind of opportunity was going to come your way. And that's what I kind of do with my own music. I kind of improvise, do sketches, and then kind of chances are I'm going, going to go on a trip so I have time to let those sit and come back and listen with fresh ears and kind of um, say, well, does this fit a vocalist? Does, is this right for myself? And kind of make all those decisions and um, make notes for myself to remember everything. So you, you build up a bit of a vault of yeah. little ideas, little yeah. grooves. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. Stick figure things, and then you kind of start to add flesh and skin and everything else as you kind of really have a, a legitimate reason to kind of bring some of the things to, to completion. Mm -hmm. It's like the groove is the backbone. That's yeah. where it all starts. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Speaking yeah. of grooves then, um, you started out playing in bands yourself mm -hmm. when you were a younger yeah. man in Chicago. Uh, you kind of settled on the drums after a while? Yeah, I started off on guitar. We had to take three instruments when I was in high school. I, I took guitar because I had two brothers that played, so we had guitars in the house. So I thought that would give me kind of at least I have something to practice on. And I found guitar wasn't really right for my fingers and switched to bass, which I still play now. I played some bass on the album as well. And then I kind of... Uh, kind of switched gears and moved to drums when uh, someone came through the neighborhood and said he was uh, putting a band together and he's looking for a drummer. I said, well, I'm a drummer. And of course I wasn't, so I had to hide out from this guy while I practiced. And then I ended up getting in his band. And that's where we come across the, the Earth, Wind, and Fire people directly, where one of their scouts heard me practicing in my, my mother's basement and started kind of maybe interviewing me about doing some um, maybe some potential session work with those guys and that didn't sit well with the band I was in because they only selected me and not any of the other members. Yeah. So you, you, you could have played drums, sorry this is just totally new inform information for me, this is great. So you could have played a little bit of drums for Earth, Wind and Fire. Yeah, it was, it was and a close call. There's been lots of close calls over the years um, where even like a situation with like Sade, where someone mentioned my name as far as a potential pool of producers or something like that. And of course, the, um, I guess the A&R people and some of the people not really familiar with the music were like, well, isn't that like house music this guy does? So he kind of immediately ruled it out. So that's kind of happened time and time again as far as someone having an idea that's more viewed as radical and then it kind of getting shot down at an executive level or something like that. Okay, let's do a rewind on that little story there. Let's put some context in there. Um, okay. When you said that you were approached by Shadi, I wasn't approached by her. It was, I was, it was mentioned in the potential people for her to work with as she's coming up to a new project released, yeah. Mm -hmm. And this was happening in the early 90s when you were signed to MCA. This probably would have been right after that, maybe the mid-90s, and I think the same thing, maybe Shaka Khan, Jody Watley, different people like that, where Howard Hewitt, which I ended up in direct contact with his manager, sending some tracks to him that I guess were maybe too hip for his flavor because he is more doing the kind of crooner kind of thing, you know, which is more straightforward. And mine kind of had like a maybe an urban edge to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, because this kind of period around the early 90s, uh, we'll just jump around now that you brought that up. Okay. Uh, when you were on MCA in mm -hmm. the early 90s, that was for your first Mr. Fingers record introduction. It was for the second one. The first one was Amnesia. It was, which is... Yeah. So yeah, introduction right. was slated next. Okay. Okay. And, uh, and when you were on MCA, I think this is quite a formative time for you. Would you agree? Well, I was learning a lot. That was kind of one of the... the, the main reasons I was really interested to see what happens inside the bigger you know, companies as opposed to the little small one I was doing. Yeah. And what kind of drew you to go to um, like a label like MCA at the time in the early 90s? Well, that would be you know, my manager was kind of connected in with, with MCA and 
it ended up kind of being a, a more of a package for them at that point with myself and with uh, my manager's label and the things he was doing. And what was your manager's label for those who wouldn't be it was familiar? Black Market. For you. Heck yeah. And Black right? Market yeah. Um, yeah. in the UK, you've had a long-standing relationship with that label. Um, yeah. When you m moved into that world, uh, interestingly, I'm, I'm pretty sure your album introduction came out on the same day as Eric B and Rakim's Don't Sweat the Technique. Did it? I didn't know that. Yeah, it was okay. the exact same day. Okay. Um, and on the same label as well, which is fascinating to think of the context of your music as Mr. Fingers existing in the same world as that kind of r revolutionary rap and hip hop music. Mm -hmm. um, how did putting out an album based around the feeling and the mood and the musicality of house music at the time go down because it was quite a new th a new thing to do um well i mean I guess from my perspective we had kind of been doing it for five six seven years and it had been consistently growing even with like with the first fingers inc album in 88 we were immediately approached by warner brothers and some labels like that but that didn't work out either because they wanted to make some changes in the personnel of the group. Um, but I mean, it, it didn't, I didn't really even factor all that in because you can't really kind of focus, you know, on everything that's going on. You have to kind of focus on the, the area that you're kind of dealing with in particular. So I don't think uh, introduction kind of caused any harm to Eric V and Rakim sales because it's a totally different audience. Yeah, so we had to more focus on the initial audience we were dealing with and potentially grow that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you mention audiences there, who were you not making music for, because that sounds like it's a, a chore, mm -hmm. um, which it isn't at all, but who did you feel that, that house music at the time with these albums was really um, pushed towards or who was interested? Because you've always made music that exists also without the club context. You've mm -hmm. always kind of had one eye like off the dance floor as mm -hmm. well. Yeah, because we, I mean, we, we, the term underground is used a whole lot, but we live most of our lives above ground, a bigger percentage of it, I think. So for the, the music to be able to kind of reach into both spaces is pretty essential to kind of have, you know, a well-rounded enjoyment of it. If it can only be in a party environment, yeah, you kind of, what about when it's time for the family reunion or different things, you know, that are not in club environments. So, again, it kind of just draws back to my, my development, you know, and how my taste was cultivated with music. It was just all styles of music right in our little household, you know, whether it was disco or whether it was blues or gospel or what have you. It, would, we, it all kind of seemed to work in our household and with family events and things like that. Um, what kind of records we put on at these family events? What were like the Larry Heard favorites? I don't know if it was the Larry Heard favorites because I have four brothers and I had two parents who also bought records. So it was a big fight for who's playing the next record. And, but it would, for me, it might end up being like a Parliament record, Mothership Connection or something. My brother would have probably picked the Average White Band one. They were both playing guitars. Average White Band and George Benson or something. Or, or one of them would go back to maybe a West Montgomery record or something like that. And my, my dad was the Count Basie, Ella Fitzgerald, Harry Belafonte kind of guy. And then he kind of evolved into Smokey Robinson and the Temptations, and he bought the first Funkadelic album home in 1970 that surprised all of us because that was so out of character for him. And then he bought Donna Summer's record home a few years later, Love to Love You, Baby. And my mother brought the Silver Convention home. So they were all kind of, we were all kind of stumbling across things that we would just bring into the household and everybody else would hear it. And then it spread throughout the family, aunts, uncles, Grandparents, everybody bought records around us, so everyone had something to contribute when you said, hey, you bought any new records? Yeah. Everybody had something. And that's a pretty hip family you had there Yeah, and everybody up. played piano, so we, um, I think going back, back down the, the, the timeline, there was a time before they had televisions, they seemed to have a piano as the entertainment, and the, the family would gather around someone 
someone always knew how to sight read and, and they would play the songs and maybe the other people would sing along, but that was their entertainment. And we came up with a piano as far back as I can remember, we had a piano. Tell me a little bit about the, the musicality that you started to learn early on as well as playing mm -hmm. in the cover bands as a teenager. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the musicians that you really loved and perhaps paid quite close attention to in terms of their skill perhaps, as well as having records in the house to play that you enjoyed. Mm -hmm. Were there particular, say, drummers or, or pianists um, mm -hmm. or guitar players that, that really tickled your fancy? Mm -hmm. um, I think the first drummer I kind of picked up on was uh, Neil Peart. I hope I'm saying that right, from Rush. That's the stuff I would play all the time, all the 2112 and, you know, that kind of stuff. You know, it, was, it was challenging, you know, from a um, time signature kind of point of view. And just overall, it was a, a, a more of a challenge than, you know, playing the Donna Summer beat, which is pretty straightforward. And... Uh, no real dramatic changes or anything. So that's who I, even my set, I had it set up to kind of duplicate his, his set. Mm -hmm. When you were playing in these bands with that musicality in mind, how did you feel that those bands like it taught you lessons, good or bad, about what kind of music that you wanted to pursue? Um, I didn't know I wanted to pursue a kind of music. I just wanted to pursue music. So any kind of music would have been satisfactory for me, just as uh, long as you can kind of do it freely without anyone kind of over your shoulder trying to, you know, nudge you in directions you don't really feel comfortable about or confident doing. You know? mm -hmm. Because as a drummer, you have, you know, we're talking about a groove as the backbone, the drummer mm -hmm. is the backbone, the percussion. The drummer and the bass. Yeah. Yeah, yep. Drummer and the bass together, yeah. And um, how did you find that experience of playing in a band as the drummer? Um, I don't know how I found it, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> what, I mean, what's bad? What else? I mean, how much fun is just banging on something, you know? But, I mean, <laughs> the, drummer often is, um, the drummer often is the guy who, like you say, mm. has the rest of the band looking over their shoulder saying, OK, just play this for us. Mm -hmm. Did you have much of a creative input in that scenario? No, I didn't. That's kind of what led to me kind of evolving to the point where I just had to get my own gear as far as like some kind of a, a keyboard, a synthesizer, because we had a keyboard in the house. We had a piano, but I wanted one that kind of did more than a piano was capable of. So I ended up buying um, the Jupiter 6, and I, Mystery of Love and Washing Machine were made that same day when I bought it and just recorded it to a cassette. So I got, had ideas bottled up inside of me, I guess, you know, from all of those years of, you know, being in the background of a band and, you know, you kind of maybe get uh, inspired by songs you're playing and things like that. You get an uh, alternate idea or something like that, or maybe a remix idea for some song. But that, yeah, just one thing, just like life, where one thing leads to the next thing and you don't, you don't really kind of record them as you're going along, you just kind of more flow as the river kind of changes courses, and that's what I kind of did. Part of the improvisation where you kind of just try to pay attention to what's happening, what's coming near, and you know, where I have to turn left or turn right, or you know, make some kind of a crucial life decision or something. When you're talking about uh, going from playing instruments in bands and then getting the Jupiter 6 and also the 707 mm -hmm. as another machine that you used, yeah. these were very new machines at the time. There wasn't like a rule book. There wasn't videos to watch of, of, yeah. of how, to, how to play I these don't machines. I think there was a YouTube at that time. There definitely anything. wasn't yeah. a YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Tell me then how in your mind through playing instruments and listening to records, you transferred some of that musicality into how you would touch these machines. Um, well, the thing about being a musician is like, it's not what you, I discovered I was a musician. I didn't become one. I discovered I was just pretty much bred to be one in the environment that I was in with both parents playing a piano. So we're hearing people play these notes correctly, playing chords correctly and sight reading and all this other stuff. So that stuff is kind of being ingrained into your psyche right from the cradle. And you just can't, it's kind of like when riding a bike. 
because you get a new kind of bike, you don't think about riding bikes differently. No, you just get on and you start pedaling and having fun. And that's what happened with us with the, the machines and everything. It's just, you, of course, you're not doing anything complex because you don't know how to do anything complex yet. But the basic, let me get it running, get it on the 4-4 four, four beat, was, which was kind of easiest to work with, you know, starting think, things off simple and then just kind of ad-libbing, going in, again into improvisation. So mm -hmm. by this point, you get the grooves down, mm -hmm. uh, and then you meet Robert Owens, mm -hmm. as you say. Um, how did you meet him, and how did you start talking about making music together? Uh, well, um, I met Robert at a party. He was DJing, and someone invited me to a party uh, some part of town. I can't even remember. But he was playing, and he played Mystery of Love. And I went over and uh, thanked him for playing the song and what have you, and we just got to chit-chatting. He told me he wrote lyrics, and. Uh, we just exchange phone numbers, so it's not some kind of a heavens opening up kind of scenario. It's just regular people meeting who have you know a common interest, and it was kind of the same thing for him. I think he had a lot of bottled up ideas that kind of no one was interested in hearing, and maybe if you're a singer in a family, you're singing all the time, and they more want you to shut up than anything. So I was kind of was a receptive person and. And actually, the first day we worked together, we recorded a path and uh, empty that showed up on my introduction album was done that first day. Yeah, you actually managed to get a lot of work done in the first day. Yeah, Very we did productive. a lot of, of first takes, like Bring Down the Walls was the first take, Never No More Lonely, a lot of first takes with Roberts, you know, so there was, it was very little time to actually think, because everybody thinks a lot of thinking is going on, but we're more feeling our way through, it's more meditative than analytical. We're more feeling, just like when you, you hear someone else's record, it's something that you feel internally about it that makes you want to hear it again or, or buy it or something like that. It's not E equals MC squared, let me go buy this record. And it's, no, you're just feeling it. Those, um, there's two things in that that are actually really interesting, and that is um, in the way that you felt that you had a lot to get out from being in those bands and then, then getting your hands in machines and Robert Owen sang in choirs and mm -hmm. was he singing in a style that his voice didn't suit or they didn't understand his voice or? I don't know. He was living in California, I know, when he was doing the, the choir thing. And when I just met him, of course, I hadn't heard him at all. So we just got together and that's when I heard him when he was on site, you know. And we just kind of started playing around. It's like, okay, he sounds good. It's definitely different. I, I'm trying to think who he made me think about as far as a singer. Maybe Joe Tex. For some reason, Joe Tex came to mind. And a little bit of like Leroy Hudson as far as how is it vocal characteristics. Yeah. And when you re-recorded um, Mystery of Love with him, mm -hmm. um, there was only three acetates of that that were available. Who ended up getting the three, the three well, copies? Well, that wasn't with Robert. That was the original version. It was like 110 BPMs. Mm -hmm. the, um, they said Frankie Knuckles had one in his possession when he passed. I think they said Ron Hardy had one in his possession when he passed. And that one went to Larry LeVan, I think. And I think it was still in his possession when he passed. So, and I have the third one. Not a bad two or three people to have. Yeah, they kinda, <laughs> I guess they kind of circulated their way around to different sets of hands over the years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Robert Owens also, as you say, he, he moved away in the early 90s. He wasn't in Chicago anymore. And yeah, he, he moved, moved to New York. He moved yeah. to New York. Uh -huh. When, after you'd made that album together and his voice and your music were known together, mm -hmm. um, they kind of they really complemented each other and worked together. When he moved away, um, you started writing your own lyrics a little bit more and singing mm -hmm. a little bit more. Was that just because he left and you were like, oh, I'm left without a singer now? I think it was just now, something or? that happened. Maybe I kind of got more fueled as far as, you know, having someone receptive to what you're doing kind of does a lot for you, uh, you know, internally as far as your motivation. It's like, okay, here's someone that will at least listen to it even if they can't sing it. But I um, had Ron Wilson as well who didn't, didn't really write a lot of lyrics, so I wrote the lyrics for him for like So Glad and different songs like that. Um, 
but I forget what the question was now. I mean, <laughs> you, when he moved away, you started writing oh, okay, and yeah. singing. Yeah. And that's quite, you know, that's quite a leap to go from drums to machines and then you're putting your own yeah. voice in there. Uh -huh. How did yeah. you, um, was it quite a tender thing to start doing? Were you quite um, unsure? No, I didn't. Again, another thing, this, all of this stuff is in process around us, so there's not a lot of time to stop and think. It's kind of more just reacting. Should I try this? Should I make an attempt at it? So that's what it was. It's kind of like diving into the deep end of the pool every time, not knowing whether it's hot water or sulfuric acid or what. You just dive in. And I was working on What About This Love? And actually, David Hollister was supposed to sing that. And he didn't show up to the studio, and I sang a scratch. And everybody at the studio liked the scratch I sang. And I said, like, well, maybe we should just do it this way. And that's what we ended up releasing. That ended up on the charts right next to Been Around the World and I, I, I. So again, you know, it kind of fueled what was going, uh, kind of going on with Renee, my manager, with the MCA thing. It just the timing of it couldn't have been better to kind of just slip in on the deal he was kind of in the process of doing anyway for his label. Because I think one of the really charming things about your music is that the voice and the lyrics just really seem to touch people. Um, I know that's something that's been said many times before, but I'd like to know a little bit more about how you think about writing lyrics, like what kind of world in your head are you in when you're sitting mm. writing? I don't know. I don't know if I think a lot. See, even with me thinking right now, it's hard. Um, so again, I don't think a lot. I just kind of dive into things more than, because if I think about it, I'll spend eight hours thinking, and then you'll be exhausted from thinking, and you'll you never get around to actually doing anything. So I find that works best for me to just jump in. And if you make some kind of mistake, that's, that's, just, that's just your problem for right now. But um, yeah, I usually more impulsive when it comes to music, you know. That that um, idea of being impulsive also really chimes with like the versatility of the music that you've made. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe around the late 80s or early 90s, there were a few different kind of schools in house music happening. There was like the hard or more minimal stuff like Mike okay. Dunn and Armando, and then you've mm -hmm. got the more like soulful R&B stuff that Steve Silk Harley might have been making. Uh, but you seem to kind of exist in this really lovely Venn diagram between all of it. You had mm -hmm. acid music, you had the more R&B things, you had the more like the tender, melodic things. Um, mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about how you would make the more acid kind of tracks? Because I listened to you talk to Benji B very, very recently, maybe it was even mm -hmm. yesterday. Um, and I was really surprised to learn that you'd hardly ever used a 303 to make your acid tracks? No, it wasn't. Never on a release. Maybe on something I drafted out and just recorded on a cassette for myself to kind of listen back to. But it, yeah, it took some guy, you know, doing an interview for a book he was writing about the TB303 for me to discover that none of the releases were TB303. But kind of bummer for his book, <laughs> but, you know, interesting note for myself that, you know, I kind of, people kind of believe that it was a TB303, you know, but I was just, uh, any other arbitrary synthesizing, you just pretty much do the same thing, operate the knobs, and you know, got kind of the same kind of effect. So it's more me, my being a mad scientist a little bit. And that's where you kind of get to just, just be wacky. You don't have to, again, not thinking, just more just being crazy, you know, with, with your art form, like a, like a person with a paintbrush. You're just going nuts. You're not really drawing anything in particular, just doing something. Um, one of the other things that's really interesting when you think about how House was splintering off around that time is that a lot of it was very much tracks for the club. They were for the dance floor, they mm -hmm. were coming out in 12s and EPs. Yeah. And around that time you started to make a lot more albums and longer albums, an mm -hmm. hour or more than an hour. Um, and I'd like to know what your thinking was when you sat, when you sat down to create an album, particularly when you think of the ones in the mid 90s that are like sceneries and songs and the Alien record, mm -hmm. they had a, a more home listening feel and a conceptual feel. Okay. Can you tell me a little bit about that period making those albums and hmm. what you were kind of reaching for, for yourself? Another tricky one for me, because I, I don't know if I'm ever reaching for anything other than, you know, the, the simple factor of, you know, when you're making something, you want someone on the receiving end to enjoy it 
that's kind of, I think, the goal of everyone when you're making something, you want somebody to enjoy it. But far as far as my process, sketches, 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 hundreds, thousands, you know, tens of thousands, and you go back through them when, you, when it's time to do an album, that's when you start going through and saying, this, I think this will work, and I think this will work. You kind of harvest things out of what you kind of been storing away and try to verify that it hasn't come out before because I think I did that one time where I What, you released something twice by accident? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, yeah. <laughs> what was that? Uh, <laughs> Tell me what you released twice I, by I, accident. You know, I can't even remember which one it was, but I do that's recall. That's the problem. <laughs> I recall it. I think it was on the... Um, do, sorry. I thought somebody was, was giving me an answer. Was that shouting out the answer there? Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool, thank uh, you. But I think it was something that was on a uh, soundtrack from the Duality Double Play, one of the, the tracks on the latter half of the album. I discovered that it had been released on another project, like maybe like Dance 2000 or something. Uh, so I was like, okay, well, I guess I'll do better screening of, you know, what's already been released before. But I usually try to make a note for myself. But then I just process is just going through kind of what you already have and and during the process of taking some of those things and trying to d develop them, sometimes you come up with brand new ideas. That's where songs like Quasars and things like that come from. It wasn't in the archives. It was just an idea that happened on the spot. You know. I ask about those albums in particular out of the many, many that you've made over the years because it felt like a direction that um, acknowledged the influences that made Chicago House what it is. Because I think mm -hmm. still to this day, there's a slight misconception that, you know, Chicago House happened in a vacuum and it was this explosion out of nowhere, but it drew from music from all over the world. Um, yeah. were, there, mm -hmm. were there certain styles of music that you were listening to that were influencing that more melodic, instrumental side of you? I'm not exactly sure, because the stuff I would have been listening to personally would have been way more radical than anything I've ever done. But um, but then we did come up with um, some great, tremendous presenters on radio, again, from the time of birth. All the songs these guys were playing, these guys and ladies were playing, are the songs that are classics right now, that they, they had the, the kind of insight and instinct to know which songs to present. So it was, it was blues, it was gospel, it was soul, it was country, it was rock and roll, it was some of everything. And um, my dad came home with Jim Croce albums and Sha Na Na albums, just like he came home with Funkadelic. He didn't discriminate. If you like it, you like it. It doesn't matter who made it. Because in, um, radio played an enormous role, as you've seen in your life. Uh, in mm -hmm. Detroit, there's people like the Electrifying Mojo mm -hmm. who were completely seminal. Who was like the Chicago equivalent of the Electrifying Mojo for you? Hmm. It was probably probably would predate Electrifying Mojo. This would be Herb Kent. Yeah. Who's Herb Kent for those who wouldn't be familiar? Well, Herb Kent is uh, actually he uh, goes back to the days of when a, a black radio presenter could only play classical music. They couldn't pick out any uh, what was called race records at the time but he was one that gradually started to play soul music and uh, Barry Gordy, I'm sure, was feeding him things from Motown and they were trying out things on the Chicago marketplace and it turned out to influence the whole Midwest and start to influence the whole country, some of the stuff they were doing and the sides they were picking off the singles that Motown was releasing. I also ask this because the way that you've crafted your albums, I feel, have also had uh, a love affair or like almost like a love letter to to radio there's this phrase um called a quiet storm mm -hmm. could you explain what quiet storm means in terms of radio i'm not sure what that means oh, someone else okay. coined that Damn. but I, I, um, music has fit into that for yeah. us you know the in chicago they were playing you know what about this love and soul survivor and things like that on the smooth jazz station, yeah. That, that's, yeah. That, that, that's exactly what it was. It was mm -hmm. a style of, um, I know you, you were kind of joking, maybe you'll have an answer, so maybe mm -hmm. this, is, this is my one answer. Mm -hmm. It's this um, term that was coined in the 1970s uh, by a radio host uh, called Melvin Lindsay, who it was um, trying to bring the soulful, more melodic, like R&B and, and smooth jazz onto okay. the radio outside, as you say, like, race radio like okay. terms okay. um and i always thought that the correlation of that between your more melodic albums was really interesting mm -hmm. were you kind of 
thinking of the radio when you were when you were I crafting these songs? It may have songs? just been coincidence. I mean, I was conscious of radio because we the radio was so good that we always had radio on. Like right now, we always have radio off. <laughs> we were playing our MP3 players or you know Wi-Fiing something to our a Bluetoothing something to our our car, you know. But the radio was tremendous. It was always on. It was a fixture in the household for our mother's little AM radio to be always on. And that was overnight, and then we started to hear the, Herb Kent was the same. He proposed the Hot Mix 5 concept to the radio station, by the way. So that's how we get the Hot Mix 5, because of him and his, his instinct, of course. Um, but he was playing like missing persons and Telex and Kraftwerk and Emmanuel Gottsching overnight, you know, once everybody sleep, you have freedom to kind of do some experiments, and that's what he did, the Herb Kent punk out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of experiments, we talked a lot about machines, but not about you performing. So mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about what the current live performance looks and sounds like. How does it move? What can we expect to see Let's you do see. later on? Well, you have myself and uh, doing playing keyboards and singing here and there, and you have uh, Mr. White singing and playing some keyboards here and there. We have Robert Owens this time around doing vocals. So it should be very interesting. I get great graphics by uh, Daniel Emba from Mexico City. So I think all those elements together, along with the crowd in the house, you know, should provide a, a nice platform to, for us to build on for the night and to have some fun, yeah. Is there a particular track from your new album that you really enjoy playing at the moment? Um, well, there's a couple of tracks from the album in the show, but I, it would the ones I want to actually get around to are the more jazzy ones. So we'll see how to do that. That's that's the challenge. But is that maybe uh, the next step? Getting some some more musicians into the show to I play the know. jazzier we have stuff. To have to kind of go day by day and figure out what's gonna work, what's gonna. Um, be practical and all that kind of thing because you know all the people have to move around the globe if you're kind of doing it so we're just playing it by ear for the moment you know well, so we got I, robert owens is the new addition for right now yeah. Yeah. well i'm sure we will be all ears later on yeah. i kind of want to open up to questions but before i do i want to give a thank you to larry for talking to us thank you all thank you <laughs> Does anyone have a question for Larry Heard? Shall I just, I'll, I'll just hand over my mic, I'll just go. I'll be the Blue Peter moment. Okay. <laughs> um, in terms of like house in the early days when it was sort of forming into a genre and like when you were creating those first tracks from Asia and stuff like that, um, was there like a feeling at the time that this music can have a like will change the world and it's going to have a deep impact on people's lives over the next you know 30 40 years like did did you ever think that what we're doing at the minute we we could be on something massive um to be honest no we didn't think that we we didn't know we're just so happy that you know people in our community were responding positively to, to what we were doing and cuz prior to that you we came to this music with this music to anyone you're like, well, what's this? Get this out of here. But fortunately for us, guys like Ron Hardy and Frankie Knuckles and some of the other DJs around town were flexible enough, you know, to try some of the stuff out and brave enough, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't know, you know, 30, 40 years later what was going to happen, you know. But. <laughs> Anyone else at all? Hi, pal. Two six. In terms of your production process, you were talking about that you make a lot of sketches. I was just un uh, curious to know, like, if you have any set method when you go about perhaps laying down a new idea, like perhaps do you always start with the, the 707 or whatever, or start with a bass line? Is there any set method, or is it fairly free form and kind of you see no, how it's it It's pretty arbitrary. I could start with a key. If I find a cool keyboard sound, I might start there. If I find some cool loop, I must ju might just loop something to just run as a rhythm to kind of just add live on top of, but no specific kind of plan of attack. So like jazz music then? Mm. Yeah, yep. improvise, improvise. Get something to start with and just kind of build. Yeah. Okay. Oh, back. Thank 
Hi. Uh, just want to yeah. say, first of all, it's absolutely amazing to hear you speak this afternoon. So again, thank you from mm. all of us. Oh, thank you so all cool. for, for attending. Yeah. Um, it, just uh, a bit of a silly question, really, but I just wanted to ask you: um, Did you uh, were you ever involved, and and where was there? Um, could you describe if there was any kind of rivalry between the Chicago house and the Detroit techno scenes? Um, and, and how did that kind of play out as they were both kind of emerging? Well, I, I guess I'm sure there was rivalry. I think it, that we kind of, we probably goaded each other on as far as, because I know um, when I, I heard some of Derek May's first tracks, I was like, whoa, who is this? And it just kind of, it just kept you on your toes, just like all the musicians and like, I, when I was playing drums, if I came across another drummer who was really good, it just made you go home and practice all that much harder. And that's what happened with us in Chicago and Detroit, where there was always something good coming out of there. So we're like, okay, we got to bring our game up to par now. Yeah. Well, At least me personally, I, we didn't have like a meeting or anything, <laughs> but you know, just got maybe something I was accustomed to doing, you know, for a lot of years on the independent scene there. Yeah. Okay. Anyone else? Hiya. Hiya. Uh, Hi. Can you give a description of what it was like a night you'd play in like the late 80s, early 90s compared to now? Like the crowd and yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, can you say that one more time? I'm sorry. Like, sorry. <laughs> like, um, what, like what it was like to play an event um, in the like, late 80s, early 90s compared to today? Like, was there a difference in the crowd or? Um, no, I can't really see any real difference. I mean, of course, it's a, a different generation of people, but still kind of had a real passion for music and passion for dancing. It was like some of the dancers back then were nuts. We kind of saw some in, uh, in London and so we did Oval Space, and some of these people that were dancing, like, wow, they, they were the show, you know? And it's, that's great when you see that happening, that kind of energy, yeah. But that's kind of like the old Chicago style, where the, the DJ would be sometimes on, like, the mezzanine or the second floor yeah, of the club looking down. Yeah, you couldn't see the DJ, yeah. yeah. All you could do was hear him playing, because I, I was at this place, um, I can't try to remember the name of it, but I, the, the music was so good, I finally, I, you could see the top of someone's head way up there. And it's like, well, who's playing? And they said, that's Ron Hardy. I said, oh, that's Ron Hardy. I've been hearing about this guy. <laughs> but it was funny because you, you hear the name, but, you know, again, you didn't have any face to associate with it. But once I kind of was in a room with him just playing music, you know, and I didn't know who it was, I'm like, yeah, he's good. He got my attention. Yeah, yeah. Was there anyone else? Are you quite good? Fab. Um, Larry will be playing at 7 p.m. 7 o'clock, yeah. Where you'll be playing at 7 p.m. Uh, AV, and I, I hope that you have ideas about jazz and improv and soul and funk and groove all like tucked inside you now. So when you go, I want to actually see some dancers there, mm -hmm. okay? So another big round of applause for Larry here, please. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Laura.